humor, haunts, and homicide. Impressive and extensive all at the same time. (laughs) How do you do? Okay. Yeah. I'm just, you know, keeping you on your toes. You know, (laughs) Hammer Hots and Homicide, we love surprises. And there you go. You're welcome. Yes. Thank you. Welcome back. Oh, welcome back, friends, um, to episode seven. Can you believe we're here doing episode seven? Oh, it's it's been fun. It's been real. A few months ago, it was just a little baby podcast, a little idea, a little seed. Ew, I don't like that word. (laughs) (laughs) Never again will I ever say that. Sorry, everybody. (laughs) It's almost as bad as moist, I think, or a couple other words I will choose to leave out. (laughs) But wow. So like lucky number seven, we made it. Yeah, we did. Um, what's up? Uh, not really much. Uh, it's just working, and but you have some good news. I do. I start my new job on Monday. New Monday job. Yeah, that's great. Like this, like the coming Monday. Tomorrow. Yeah. yeah, tomorrow. I know. That's exciting. Tomorrow, exciting. And you know, it's in it's in the finance industry. I'm a finance manager, and I'm really excited to be starting this journey with a new company, new organization. And um, hopefully my forever career. I hope so too. Yeah, I'm really excited. So that's going on. Let's see what else uh, for me. I guess I'll just jump into me if that's cool. Oh yeah, and being narcissistic in all ways possible for you. It's all about you. It's all about me. Thank you. Um, let's see. I'm trying to sell the house. We're trying to you know get that going on here by May. Hopefully maybe April, depending on. The market, the other part about this job is I don't really know where they're stationing me right now. Um, That's still to be determined. I'm in training until about two to three months from now, and then they're going to be able to tell me where they're going to permanently place me, which definitely puts a pause on some plans. Yeah, for sure, because, I mean, that will definitely potentially determine where you're going to land, you know? Yeah, and and the cult is still going, so I got to get out. They are loud and proud. And they were loud and proud last <laughs> night. Let me tell you, mm. all animals were uh, gone. Wow. Yeah, there was some clucking going on in the morning. And by the end of the night, clucking was gone. Oh, that's great. Yeah, I believe I even heard a goat die. I'm not kidding. Wow. Yeah. But other than that, let's see. I'm uh, on a weight loss. Whoa, what did I just say? Hi. A weight loss? <laughs> a weight loss journey. Nice. So just okay. re- you know, activated my membership recently. I'm going to really focus on myself this year and really get these pounds down. I'm the biggest I've ever been in my entire life, which, you know, some people will be like, you know, go you happy in your skin, but I'm not happy in this skin. Well, you know, and you're, Taken and let me. I said that darkly. That's not what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very happy in my life. I'm just not happy with my weight. Yeah, yeah. And I'm changing that. So Good. great well, for me. I'm very proud of you. Thank you so much. And let's see. We're going on a vacation with my parents in April. So I'm preparing for that and locking down the hotel rooms in Savannah, Georgia. Oh, so back. I think we're going back to the Marshall House. Okay. Actually, yeah. My parents really want to go there, and that's honestly the only place that's like available at a decent price range. Every single hotel in Savannah and Charleston and wow. St. Augustine is sold out in like the two weeks in April we're trying to go. Wow. So, so the Marshall house it is. Ooh, I hope uh, Dylan doesn't get <laughs> ghost bitten again. I don't know, man. <laughs> I really don't know, but I will say I'm excited to go back and just explore the town and get things I didn't get to do the first time and do another haunted tour. Um, wish you were there. Yeah. But you know, we'll, we'll, we'll definitely have to schedule something. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, that's pretty much it for me at the moment. Okay. What do you got going well, on? Well, I would like to bring up that today is Mario Day. You, and, Mario, and, explain. What do you mean? Okay. Um, it's March 10th. So if you take March M-A-R 10th, it makes Mario. And it's actually like, oh. like, yeah, like I saw it on Google too. Like Google has their thing changed. It's like a legit thing. Okay. Um, And I think we definitely should celebrate it because we play Mario a lot together. I would almost call it a competitive sport. It's definitely a competitive sport, um, and I'm better than you. Oh, bitch. You better <laughs> back it down, okay? Have you ever had a six-win streak like I have? 
I don't believe anyone has that's played against you know, we me. Don't, that's we, all I'm going to say. Well, you that's know, all. we don't we don't need to talk about that. What we do need to talk <laughs> about, though, um, we will talk about how we, we love playing Mario Party. We do. Um, Even if I'm, it's till death. I'm always Peach. Unfortunately, she's <laughs> not a Peach, but she is always Peach. Yep. Yeah. Hmm. And I'm always Wario. So um, we are very competitive. We call each other names. We threaten... You know, yeah, you know, what we should li- do? In each other's lives. I think and... for the next uh episode drop when we do little photos on our posts, we should put some from Halloween when we were Peach and Wario, yes, and that way people will understand the level of love and competitiveness that we have. Um, and we even wear these costumes sometimes during the gaming that we do, especially. <laughs> um, I have been known to throw the peach wig on after a win, and I'm known to throw <laughs> my Wario gear on before my win. And we uh, we do winning songs like we all we each pick a song. So when we win, you get to play that song, and it it makes it so where that you end up hating you end up hating a really good song sometimes. Yeah, because... <laughs> yeah. I'm sure that you hated "Cuff It" for a while by Beyonce. Mm-hmm. Uh, I really hated um, "All I Do Is Win, 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 No Matter What." That I got, I can never listen to that song again, yeah. and it's not even your winning song anymore. It's not. We do cycle through them, so you can't just do one all the time. And especially for people like me that win often, you know, I can't. I got to keep it fresh. Well, we don't want my audience to. I mean, if we're being honest, I would say that out of the the group of people that we play with, you and I probably win. Oh, for the sure. Most. I mean, for sure. Like without a doubt, without a shadow of a yeah. doubt, yeah, we're we're, um, we're awesome. I've just so. had that slight edge. I'm better than you, but <laughs> anyway. <laughs> okay, bitch. We have, we used to play Mario Kart a lot, but we haven't played that in a while. But they've got a lot of new. Well, yeah. Tracks. So they have the new tracks. I did play the new tracks only like one time by myself. So we need to kind of get, probably get back on. What that is there? Too. Eight or four more? Eight. Okay. Oh. And that was like completing that whole like expansion okay. thing they had done. All right. So. Well, we're putting that on the list of yeah. things to do very shortly. Yeah. So awesome. Moving right along. Mm-hmm. Um, how's game of Thrones going? Oh, where did I, where did I leave off last time? So I believe you were like, maybe I think it was on a, we were like on a slow, you didn't have like a ton. Of oh, talk that's about right. It. it was the beginning of season seven. I think I was maybe even into episode two at that point. Uh, wow, I really rushed through it. I'm almost to the end. I'm on episode four of season eight. Oh, is there only six, I think? I think because it was a shorter season for oh, sure. Shit. Oh, but this, coming to but an the end. episodes were longer. Okay. So let me tell you what's going on. Again, spoiler alert, mm-hmm. just me out there in the world alone watching Game of Thrones, but here we are. So um, they had the longest night. I can't remember if that's the name of the episode or long night, but the big episode with the White Walkers and the Night King. Yeah. And that was crazy. I know that you and I had kind of talked about it when I was texting you like I do with all my updates and live time, but I didn't mind the way they shot it too much. I think for the most part, it really kind of made you feel like you were there almost. I, I really enjoyed, I really enjoyed it. I know it got a lot of, you know, flack and people didn't like it, but, um, and see, I, didn't, I thought it was great. I didn't keep up with Game of Thrones at that time. So I wasn't really paying attention to what people were saying about things. All I know is that I remember a lot of people saying they hated season eight. They hated season eight. Yeah all together and people were like i guess doing petitions to get it rewritten i'm like what is wrong with you yeah i i mean again i was definitely not on that definitely not on that i just camp. don't see that problem and there's not been a season that i didn't think was better than the other i felt it it all flowed very, very nicely very cohesive yeah and um i really can't tell like a, a one apart really if i were to pinpoint things but uh, that happened that big battle i i loved it and then aria taking that fucking dagger into mm. the night king ooh so satisfying uh what else brianna of tarth getting knighted and her smile <laughs> bitch i cried yeah i love I her cried so much. oh my god i didn't even cry with the deaths but when she smiled and started tearing up that got me i don't know why maybe it's the actress herself maybe it's because she went through a lot and never smiled but finally got what she wanted but didn't want people to know she wanted it yeah and that was just to be knighted and to be recognized for all of her hard work and yeah. she deserved that shit she she's the best fucking character go brianne go brianne of tarth <laughs> But yeah, that's really that's where I'm at in Game of Thrones, and I'm almost done. So next episode, I should be able to talk about all the things, and then okay, and I'm even ready to go for a second watch just so I understand it more. And I'd probably say like six months to a year. Okay. Yeah. Well, I we might join you. Okay, let's do it. <laughs> what do you? So what are you listening to? What's your latest scoop? What you got? Well, I'm still um listening to that book that I had talked about a couple weeks ago, um the Stephen King book about time travel. Oh yeah, like, How, how's that going? Um, it's going really good. Okay. I don't really want to give anything away. There's not really 
like I'm excited to finish it and then and then we'll and then we'll these. talk about it. But um I I am I am not really watching anything right now like this week, but I'm all caught up on on my podcasts. Okay. Um my favorite murder, of course. Yes. Uh, my cur- I would say my current like well, my favorite murder is always my favorite, but Love like my them. but like my current kind of favorite is Anatomy of Murder. Oh, they're so good. With uh Anna Siga Nicolazzi. Anna Siga Nicolazzi and, and Scott, oh my God, Scott Weinberger. Um, and I am also caught up for the most part on Buried Bones with Paul Holes and Kate Winkler Dawson. I think you would like that one. I don't know that one, but I've heard them mention it in my favorite yeah. murder. And then, um, of course, New Heights with Jason and Travis Kelsey. I'm obsessed with their podcast also. They're so fucking and funny. And that's another one I need to watch. They're so fucking funny. Or not watch, but you know. Listen. You actually can watch oh, okay. it. They do. They actually record there completely. So anyway. Well, maybe I'll do that. Um, yeah. So I'm all caught up on that stuff. And I'm still I'm still going to watch Traders, I promise. So. You know what I love about all those podcasts <laughs> is they all kind of have the same mission, but in their own variations. Like My Favorite Murder, personally, is my favorite podcast just because they have a natural banter. They are funny. They're inspirational. Yeah. You know, they they tell great gripping stories. And well, and it doesn't hurt that you know, like you are very much like Georgia, and I'm very much like Karen. I feel and that we're way. best friends, and yeah, and, you know, it, it's just you almost make they make you feel like you're they're your fucking friends. They are my friends. So hopefully, you guys feel that way about us because yeah. that's how I we feel you. about you. I love you, Karen. Love you, Georgia. <laughs> <laughs> I hope they hear this one day and they're like, man, these people are awesome. Right? They're really supporting us. And we do, you know, this is a podcast and it's a very competitive market, but this is honestly for us, this is fun. We're not really hoping. No, it's so fun. Just really be super competitive. But hell, if we get big one day, of course, that's going to be great. But it's nothing that we're like striving for or expect even. But No, it's been great. I mean, I think it's been like, it, it's allowed us to spend more time together. Yeah. And like, yeah. you know, like, you know, I don't, I'm not, I'm not trying to get emotional. Don't cry. I'm not trying Don't to get cry. emotional. <laughs> I can't cry. Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm done. I'm like, okay. My makeup will smear. <laughs> I, don't, I don't wear makeup, but I just felt that that yeah. was the right time to say yeah, that. Yeah, I'm not going to, we're going to, we'll stop there. <laughs> Love you. Okay. What else do you, oh, Mad Lib time. It is Mad Lib time. Okay, okay. Can I read it this time? Yeah, you can read okay. it. Let me change it up. Okay. All right. So again, <laughs> when we do these Mad Libs, we don't even read them. We just plug them in and then we read them live for you cold and freezing. All right. So this one is frigid. called, yes, frigid, <laughs> icy, nipply, whatever you want to call it. It's called, oh, pit crew. All right. Dear pit crew, to us, RuPaul's girls, you are much more than chin candy. <laughs> <laughs> First, you are super messy helpers who do the job that, no lie, might chip our strippers. Who else is going to play a f- cart full of wet wigs and a funky brothels? into the workroom for many challenges, wearing just their panties? Second, you are our inspiration. Spanking in front of a purple screen can be very ornery. But when you're there beside us, under us, or on top of us, barking and looking all handsome as you do, it might make us shoot go by creepily. I said that wrong. It makes the shoot go by creepily. Sorry. Third, you keep that baby lube company in business. (laughs) We can't keep our titties off of you. All shiny and grotesque. Honey, forget it. You are I caviar. <laughs> <laughs> but you're our I caviar. Thank you for doing what you do. XO, the queens. Yes. Okay. <laughs> that All was, right. That's fun. Nice. I love that. You know, what are we going to do when we run out of them? Buy a new book. Or, yeah, or we can just pick some online, I guess. And, yeah. Because they have other non RuPaul's Drag Race themed. Yeah, we can just get. We're open to other I'll do genres all. I will of do Mad all Libs. Mad Libs. We'll just scour for all the fun Mad Oh, yeah. <laughs> and I might even, you know, it's something I thought about branching off to. And the, I'm just going to tell you right here, we didn't even talk about this until this moment. What if we even incorporate reading, um, what do you call those things? The bad autocorrects? Oh, my God. How do you feel God. about those? The, they're hysterical. Oh, man. And I'm in. So, okay. Yeah. So. Look forward to that, listeners. Maybe in the next episode. Maybe in the... Oh, I see what you did there. <laughs> did we just recreate a next episode? I mean... All right. For next up, next episode eight. <laughs> All right. We're going to be giving you some of that. Awesome. So, we've also got our What the Florida story. What the Florida? What the Florida? All right. Well... This website I've found is just really short snippets 
of okay. some crazy wacky Florida stories. And some of them are not super current, but these ones are of 2023. Okay. Well, so semi current. I mean, I did a 2015 story. It was last December week, 26th so this... of 23. So it's basically current. You know, that counts. Yeah. So this one in particular is called Florida Man Caught Driving Booty Patrol Truck Facing Charges. <laughs> <laughs> now, if you look this up online, you'll see that it is a white truck, a Chevy Silverado, and it's got a green stripe on the passenger side. It looks official, like it does. It looks like a f- official booty patrol <laughs> truck. <laughs> And um, it's going through a scandalous time right now in Florida. The Florida man was taken into custody in October for driving a truck painted similar to a U.S. Customs and Border Patrol vehicle. <laughs> <laughs> but instead, rooting, rooting, reading Booty Patrol. <laughs> instead of Border Patrol. Okay. Right. Oh, yeah. It does look, it looks legit. It does. The incident report states that the deputies discovered the driver had multiple run-ins with law enforcement due to his truck and even had a TikTok account for the vehicle. <laughs> Back in October, the sheriff's office asked drivers to keep an eye out for the booty patrol vehicle as it had been spotted in several other Florida counties That's as well. That's great. I'm, I'm, it's unfortunate that I never ran into it. Oh, man. I, I wish I did. Hysterical. There is a screen vehicle. I know you're not a huge fan oh, I've of this. Seen the Have scre- you? I've seen the screen vehicle. I yeah. love it. I'm a scream fanatic. It's just my favorite genre. I grew up on it. It was like my first horror movie my dad let me watch at 13 years old. And <laughs> thanks, Dad. Love you. And yeah. Um, would you like another What the Florida? Just I as would. an extra little bonus I would today. love one. Let's go. This one is called Florida Woman Calls for Sugar Daddy Appreciation Day at Board Meeting. Stop it. <laughs> but, but don't stop. But keep reading it. Yeah. The Florida woman who is um, being called a spiritual successor to last year's Florida Mistress demands taxpayer-funded BDSM dungeon at city commission meeting. Yeah. The woman took the podium at a planning and zoning board meeting with an unusual request. Accompanied by an older gentleman, she asked the board to designate March 10th as Sugar Daddy and Mommy Wait, appreciate- it's March 10th today! That's it is! That's oh my God. That's crazy. I did not, I swear, no, I did not I know. That. that is like a weird point. Okay, anyway, wow. All right. You guys, this is, this is a quote. You guys may not be aware, but Florida has the largest per capita population of sugar daddies in the U.S., she said, <laughs> pointing out that South Florida has the most concentrated populace of these aged benefactors. Board members seemed puzzled by the request. I would say so. If yeah. someone comes up there being like, hey, can today be Sugar Daddy Day? Oh, my God. Sugar Daddy Day? What the? And she has, like, this large blonde wig. And she mm-hmm. it looks like she's wearing um, feathers on her shoulders, her shoulder pads. Um, probably size E tits. I was going to say there's that the wig isn't the only thing large. Um, wearing sunglasses. <laughs> and I believe she's got lip injection. I'm not exactly sure. No. I mean, only one can speculate. But... Um, I wish I knew her name, but it did not provide that in the article. Well, Sugar Mama, you go you. Great. Well, I guess that concludes today's segment of (laughs) What What the the Florida? (laughs) Wow, that is something else. All right, great. So, Josh, what story do you have for us today? All right. So, I wanted to do a story on something that I'm going to visit when I'm on my vacation in April, just to kind of leave a little bit of lingering what's next because i want that feeling as much as i think people out there would like okay. that feeling so i'm doing it on the saint augustine lighthouse oh i've been there you have yeah okay well yes. you're gonna be able to probably recite this entire story because you're a freak what do you mean by that you <laughs> just i don't know you know facts you read facts you are like a wizard of all things trivial. Well, I will say that I did. Um, and when I do go to a historical place like that, I will read every single plaque, sign, like e- everything. Like I will be at a place for hours just like reading the history. So um, with that being said, I, I that was like six years ago probably. And, so you um, might forget some of the shit. Yeah, so I'm, I'm ready to be refreshed. All right. Well, refreshing we shall do. If anything... You don't remember, or you know, just butt in. Just interrupt me. I do what you do. Do that. All right. The St. Augustine Lighthouse, which is located in St. Augustine, Florida, is not only a historic landmark, but also a place that's captivated the imagination of many due to its infamous haunting tales. With a history dating back to the early 16th century, the lighthouse has witnessed numerous events and stories that continue to intrigue visitors to this day. Today, the St. Augustine Lighthouse stands tall at about 165 feet and offers breathtaking views of the Atlantic Ocean. However, 
it's not just its architectural beauty that draws people in. It is the ghostly legends associated with its iconic structure. While St. Augustine's Lighthouse is known for its age and history, a lot of people don't know or realize that it's not the original lighthouse structure that was built in St. Augustine. The original lighthouse structure dates back to the late 15th century, and according to some archived records and maps, this official American lighthouse was placed on the site of an earlier watchtower built by the Spanish as early as the late 16th century. In 1783, after a back-and-forth war between England and the Spanish Armada over land rights, the Spanish once again took control of St. Augustine and the lighthouse was improved structurally once more. At the beginning of the Civil War, future Mayor Paul Arnau, Arnau? Arnau. Arnau? Yeah, we're going to go with that. <laughs> a local mineral, oh shit, Menorcan? Menorcan? Menorcan Harbor <laughs> Master, along with the lightkeeper, a woman named Maria Mestre de los Dolores Andrew. Ooh. Was that good? Mm -hmm. right. I think I nailed it. Mm -hmm. Who in this role became the first Hispanic American woman to serve in the Coast Guard. Oh, Maria, yes. I know. Removed the lens from the old lighthouse and hid it to block Union shipping lanes as well as to help blockade runners remain hidden. So she was essentially kind of a badass, but um, I love her. Um, yeah. you know, it didn't go over well for her. No. The lens and clockwork were recovered around 1867. Arnal was held captive on a ship offshore and was were forced to reveal the location of the lens. Construction workers foresaw the erosion and wear and tear caused by the ocean's environment, and in 1870, the construction of a new lighthouse began. At this time, the lighthouse had run off of lard oil. Like, I guess that would be like animal fat. Yeah, it's usually whale know? fat like... at that time. That was pretty popular okay. back then. By 1874, the new tower was completed with even more enhancements than its predecessor. The new lighthouse was installed with a new revolutionary lens called the Frenzel lens. This lens enhanced the travel distance of light seen by sea. Although the structure had several improvements added to aid in the wear and tear of the elements, in 1880, the watchtower had become a victim of the ocean's wrath. Erosion and a changing coastline caused the watchtower to eventually crash into the sea. That sucks. But hey, the new one was rebuilt. And in 1885, after experiments with several different types of oil, including the previously mentioned lard oil, the lighthouse had been converted to kerosene. So they were progressing. Right. On August 31st, 1886, a Charleston earthquake caused the tower to sway violently, according to watchtowers, excuse me, watchkeepers logs, but there are no recorded long-term damage. So, I mean, I know that, I understand that St. Augustine and Charleston are not, or like, are not like super far apart, but right. that still is well. When I was surprising in... to like see that that like a Charleston earthquake would affect something in St. Augustine. So I'm trying to think of the distance here. So when we were in Savannah, we were about two hours from Charleston, but we are about five hours from Pasco County. So to get to St. Augustine probably would have been three hours. So really, we're talking almost five hours of distance. Yeah, so I mean, it's not like it's right there. Anyway. No, I mean, yeah, but you're right. It's kind of crazy. In 1907, indoor plumbing was installed in the light station, followed by electricity in the keeper's quarters in 1925. The light itself was electrified in 1936 and automated in 1955. As the light was automated, positions for three keepers slowly dwindled to one. No longer housing lighthouse families, by the 1960s, the keeper's house was rented to residents. Eventually, it was declared surplus, and St. John's County bought it in 1970. In that year, the house suffered another devastation. This time, it was by fire at the hands of an unknown arsonist. That's a dick. Literally. In 1980, a small group of 15 women in the Junior Service League of St. Augustine, which is also formally known, or excuse me, famously known as the JSL, signed a 99-year lease with the county for the keeper's house and the surrounding grounds and began a massive restoration project. Shortly after the JSL adopted the restoration, the league signed a 30-year lease with the Coast Guard to begin a restoration effort on the lighthouse tower itself. The lighthouse was subsequently placed on the National Register of Historic Places in 1981 due to the efforts of a local preservationist and author Karen Harvey. Um, 1981 was a big year. Um, I was born. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I had to slip that in there. I did. The antique lens of the lighthouse was functional until it was damaged by rifle fire in 1986. As the cause of the damage, 19 of the prisms were broken, 
As the lens continued to weaken, the Coast Guard considered removing it and replacing it with a more modern airport beacon. Again, championed by the JSL, this plan was dismissed, and the nine-foot-tall lens was restored with the help of retired Coast Guardsmen Joe Crocking and Nick Johnston. That's not his name. What? You said crocking. Oh, I did say crocking. Yeah. How did I, well, okay, it's actually, maybe, that's, <laughs> maybe subconsciously that's why, but his name is actually Cocking? Joe Cocking. <laughs> Make sure you get oh, names right here. Yeah, know, just... you're right. You're, thank you for that. Uh, see, I was trying to do the, uh, the listeners a favor, but whew, yeah, uh, anywho, anywho, this was the first restoration of its kind in the nation. Today, the St. Augustine Light Station includes the 165-foot, 1874 tower, the 1876 Keeper's House, two summer kitchens added in 1886, a 1941 U.S. Coast Guard barracks, and a 1936 garage that was home to a Jeep repair facility during World War II. You see all that when you're there, too. Really? Yeah, I can't wait. Yeah. The landmark is also a National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration weather station. Over the years, paranormal investigators and enthusiasts have flocked to St. Augustine Lighthouse in search of evidence of these ghostly encounters. Numerous reports of strange sounds, shadowy figures, and a sudden temperature drop have only added fuel to these chilling stories. Despite its haunted reputation, St. Augustine Lighthouse continues to serve as an important navigational aid for ships entering Florida's coast. Now, as much as I love a history lesson, I wouldn't be telling you the story unless it was spooky, creepy, gory, or murderous. So let's just get into it. Let's do that. Let's do that. The The Lighthouse (laughs) has been an attraction for the media throughout its history. Popular shows such as Ghost Hunters, My Ghost Story, and Travel Channel's Most Terrifying Places in America have all done documentary specials on The Lighthouse. For those seeking a spine-tingling experience, The Lighthouse offers ghost tours that delve into the haunted past. The tours provide an opportunity to learn the history of The Lighthouse while hearing firsthand accounts of paranormal encounters. Whether you believe in ghosts or not, the St. Augustine Lighthouse is undeniably a fascinating place to visit. Its rich history, combined with its haunting tales, creates an unforgettable experience for those who venture there. So if you're ever in Florida and in St. Augustine looking for a unique adventure, make sure that you add this iconic lighthouse to your itinerary. I'm going to I'm gonna swoop in here real quick. Please. Um, so I did do the ghost tour oh, at the lighthouse. No shit, please. Tell which me you're, all about Which I'm it. hoping you're going to do. Yes, I am. Um, we had previously gone during the day and like did everything, you know, got up to the top. I read every plaque, you know, like Uh I said, and we saw that they had offered the ghost tour. We didn't know at the time and it was pretty, um, inexpensive for what it was, you know? Mm, So we went back like later that I was like later that night, you go like right before, like maybe when it's like kind of dusk and, um, you can rent one of those EMF record like the e- oh. is that what this is called e- M- yeah i think you're right you know like the yeah. electronic magnetic yeah you know okay um so you can so we rented those and um basically they start off and they kind of tell you um the history and different stories like that and like you get to go inside this it, it, it was really did cool did you experience anything not like really yes and no i mean i definitely felt uneasy and you know whether that is because it was you know like nighttime and it was dark i i don't i can't say but there was like a certain area where the emf um, meter was kind of going crazy oh um and i will say too that like so when i when i climbed the top of the lighthouse during the day i was fine um you didn't feel uneasy nothing like that no, totally fine okay now when i climbed it at night like the the lighthouse itself was like felt creepy and and i was actually pretty uneasy at the top of it Mm. um and again maybe that just has to do with how high it was in nighttime and whatever but i mean i definitely had like some like feelings like some uneasy feelings but i didn't see anything no temperature drop for you or anything no i mean no um and we went we went in June. I mean, so it was pretty like humid and stuff. I, I can't really you recall. You would have recognized. Yeah, I can't really recall that, you know, anything like that. But still, regardless, it was really cool. And I would, re- re- <laughs> I would, wow, I would recommend <laughs> it to everyone. It's, it, okay. was, it was really cool. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, I cannot wait <laughs> to mesh my stories with your experience yeah. and then we can rebuttal on that. But uh, I'm going to tell you more ghost stories. How's okay. that? I love them. One of the most famous ghost story revolves around the tragic death of three young girls who drowned near the White House in 1873. In 1871, superintendent of White House construction, Hezekiah Pitty, 
moved from Cape Elizabeth, Maine, with his family to oversee the construction of St. Augustine's Lighthouse. At that time, of course, it was new. Hezekiah lived on site with his wife Mary and their children, Mary Adelaide, Eliza Edward, and Carrie. Just as any child would do, the pity children turned to the construction site and they made it basically into their own little playground, inviting the children. Of course, yeah. I mean, what else are you going to do? You're there visiting a lighthouse with nothing else to do but watch your parents work. Yeah, climbing like rocks and stuff. Yeah. I just picture it. And there was other children there with their parents mm-hmm. because that's what they did. They wanted to go with their families. So the other children all joined this little site to join them in the fun. In 1873, only the foundation and 42 feet of the 165-foot tower were completed. A railway cart moved the supplies from supply ships docked at Salt Run to the building site. Riding the cart down to the water was a favorite pastime of the Pity Children. It was kind of like a little roller coaster for them. It sounds really fun. <laughs> I, yeah, you know, but it's not so fun, as you may know the story I already. Do, but but let's, we're just, yeah. most people don't, so... The kids used the cart as a Victorian-era roller coaster, riding the cart to the water and bringing it back up to the site to ride again. Only a wooden board at the end of the rail stopped the cart from tipping over into the water. On July 10th, 1873, the three pity sisters, Mary, who was 15, Eliza, who was 13, and Carrie, who was 4, and an unknown friend of theirs who was about 10, went to the railroad cart playing it by the water. And then while they were riding the cart as normal, the wooden board at the end had stopped the cart normally from going into the water. And this time it was not in place. Oh, no. I know. The cart carrying the girls flipped into the water over, trapping the girls underneath. Oh, so they were like underneath, like in the cart. Yeah, couldn't get out. Yeah. Yeah. And you would think, you know, being a kid underneath like maybe a raft or a canoe in water, you almost think that there's a bottle of air or not a bubble, but a bubble, you know. Yeah, like an air pocket. But there's not here because of the weight of the cart. It's okay. literally pushing them into the water, which is drowning them, essentially. So the one thing that happened was that people did not see it from afar. The one guy's name who didn't actually witness it was named Mr. Dan Sessions. He was a young worker, and he immediately raced to the water. When he reached the cart using all of his strengths, he did lift it up from the top of the girls. But by the time he got there, all three of the girls had drowned. Um, sorry, three of the four girls had drowned. There was only one survivor, and it was the youngest, Carrie. And um, it had only been a matter of minutes before Mr. Sessions arrived in that scene. So, you know, it only takes a few to die, though, yeah. in the water. In the days after the incident, the construction site, as well as the town, shut down for the funeral of the girls. Following the funeral, the Pity family returned to Maine to lay their daughters to rest in the hometown. Staff researchers had not yet been able to find a final resting place of the young African-American girl who was 10 with them. Yeah. According to local folklore, it's their spirits that still linger around the area, often heard laughing or crying late at night. Many visitors claim to have experienced unexplained phenomena while exploring the lighthouse grounds. The girls sometimes appear to people in fully formed apparitions. Several years ago during the day, a guest was exploring the maritime hammock trails and came upon a young girl in a Victorian outfit sitting on a bench reading a book. As she began to ask the girl a question, another group came up from the opposite direction, and distracted by the group, the woman looked away for only a moment, turned her head back to find the little girl was gone. I'm getting chills thinking about I mean, that. It's, woo, that's kind of creepy. I mean, imagine. Um, in a similar scary instance, a woman on a ghost tour approached another woman to compliment her daughter's behavior on the tour. The woman, confused, said that she didn't have a daughter. <laughs> The other woman then told the little girl had been standing by her side most of the evening and there were no other children on that tour. Cool. Yeah. Cool. As playful spirits, the girls do enjoy playing a fair game of hide and seek, sometimes including unsuspecting people. One night in the dark lighthouse tower, a lone staff member was closing up for the night. He had heard giggling at the top of the tower, thinking that he had, had someone still left up there from a, you know, a tour or something. He returned to the top to find it only empty. As he began heading back down the tower, he heard the same giggles below him this time. Bro. Traveling down the stairs, he once again found no one there. Was it the wind? Or was he in the midst of a horror version of hide and seek and he didn't know he was the one that was it? I think that one. Yeah, I'm going to go with that one. Yeah. While the children are by no means the only tragedy that occurred in the home, the girls are some of the most active spirits that are known and reported. Psychics contact staffers frequently, and recently one of them had told us meaning the people there, right. <clears throat> uh, that the young African-American girl's name was Ellie or Eleanor. 
researchers continue to investigate the merit behind these claims, but no one's really found substantial proof. I hope proof. they end up finding, because it's just, that's just sad. It is like sad. an unknown, um, I don't Tragic like death of a 10-year-old like girl. Yeah. But at least they have a suspected name. Yeah. So she's got at least a somewhat of an identity. Another eerie tale involves a former lighthouse keeper named Peter Rasmussen. Legend has it that Peter fell to his death while painting the exterior of the tower. Some believe that his spirit remains trapped within the lighthouse, occasionally making his presence known by flickering lights or moving objects around him. In addition to these haunts, another popular haunting story involves a lighthouse keeper living in the keeper's homes in the 50s. He reported hearing footsteps upstairs. He went to investigate the footsteps, but nobody was there. The head keeper at the time was James Pippin. He had served from 1953 to 1955 and was the last keeper to live at the light station. Pippin initially lived in the keeper's house, as pre all previously did, and he had moved to a much smaller 1941 coastal lookout building, swearing that the big house was way too haunted and he would not stay in it another night. Mm. In 1955, the lighthouse lamp was fully automated. The U.S. Coast Guard replaced the lighthouse keeper with a position called light lamper. The local light lamper had all the duties of a lighthouse. Um, lamp, lamp lighter? Oh, man. <laughs> you know. Uh, you know, I... Tomato, tomato. Potato, but, yeah. Mean. The local lamp lighter had all the duties. <laughs> Where did I leave? Oh, you got me all fucked up. As a result, <laughs> the keeper's house... And uh, it was rented at that time. A local man who crafted leather goods rented the property during 1960. Um, he tells the story of waking up one night with a small girl standing by his bed. Luckily, he didn't pull the sheets, or she didn't pull the sheets off. I mean, they... you know, I know that you think that happens a lot. It does happen a lot. As he blinked, he went to go look at her again. She was gone. So she just disappeared in the flash of an eye. Mm, yeah. Fun. Not creepy at all. In 1970, after standing empty for many years, the keeper's house had burned under mysterious circumstances, gutting the home and leaving only a coquina mm -hmm. basement and a few charred timbers. St. John's County purchased the shell of the building to demolish it for safety reasons. However, 16 women in an all-volunteer formally mentioned JSL League of the St. Augustine and they'd stepped in. They ended up raising $1.2 million over that next 15 years, and they restored that. Everything was new, like I had mentioned prior. Um, but during the renovation, both construction workers and the JSL volunteers reported numerous unexplained incidents in the home. The basement was particularly an active place for ghostly encounters, being only part of the home that was really not completely burned. Perhaps the children like to play there. Today, you can still really feel that spooky yeah. presence. So the basement is where I felt the une like felt the most uneasy. And you can so you can go in there, and there's like these little like room things in the basement that's where like one in one of those little corners was where the emf detector thing was kind of going oh. like a little crazy and it wasn't just like it wasn't just me i mean there was like a group of people who were like witnessing that Shit. they're just but we didn't see like an apparition or anything but the basement was definitely like the creepiest part another cool thing to know is that for those of you that don't live in florida and that live in the north and have the luxury of a basement we don't have them oh, here yeah, we in don't mm -hmm. basements aren't really a thing yeah they're not a thing flooding is the flooding problem. hurricane you just don't have basements and honestly if you dig that far under the ground you're going to hit the aquifer and that's basically florida's basically a floating island that's going to break away one day and we're going to sink that's all we're going to be the new atlantis thanks for putting that into my head that's it you know <laughs> Oh, uh, let's see. There's another spooky tale, though. Okay. If you I like let, a little more? I would. Another evening, a female guest on the ghost tour called the Dark of the Moon Tour was standing on the first step of the metal lighthouse staircase. When she took her first step to climb the tower, she found that her shoelace was tied to the staircase. A little prankster. Whether it was a ghost or her companion playing a trick, we can just not say. Hmm. On another tour, a guide found a group of young women in the basement of the keeper's home. One of the young women who had rented an EMF meter, like you had mentioned, to measure the electrical activity caused by the spirits, that young woman holding the meter asked the girls if they wanted to play hide and seek. The meter spiked. The woman wandered to the basement searching for the hiding girls, finally finding meter activity under the spiral staircase leading to the main floor. Excitedly, she said she had found them and asked if they wanted to play again. Like before, the meter spiked. Once again, the young woman searched the basement for the girls and after several minutes found electrical energy near the children's play table. About that time, another set of guests came into the basement and reportedly the energy dissipated. I remember hearing about that. that Holy was, shit. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. 
It has gone under several renovations over time, but it still retains its historical charm. Visitors can explore both the museum and climb up into the spiral staircase for a panoramic creepy view from the top of the tower. The museum showcases artifacts from various eras, including exhibits on maritime history and shipwrecks. If you can tough it out through your fear of heights and ghostly frights, then you'll have an illuminating time at the St. Augustine Lighthouse. Do me a favor. Well, you know, I'll be saying it for you, but I'm going to say hi to the Pity Sisters for you. Thank you. Tell them I say hello. I will. (laughs) Um, I'm also going to include a picture of the Pity Sisters and the Lighthouse in our post leading up to Episode 7. And so the, uh, it's mm-hmm. yeah, they're actually creepy. Any old photo like that, they are kind of. It but... creeps me out. I don't. It's not their fault, but like I know they didn't have the technology, and you had to stand still for hours. Yeah, or... so they're like never smiling. No. So yeah, they. And they just. Yeah, the more I look at it, the more creepy it gets. So yeah, but, you have know. you seen the movie The Others with Nicole Kidman? Yes. It reminds me of her kids. Oh, yes. And the creepy photos they had that to take. Movie. That one got me. It really got me. The surprise ending. I was Woo! shook. I remember when it came out all the promotional material was basically like, you're never going to guess the ending. And I was thinking the whole time, oh, you know, there's no way. Right. And then the keepers were dead. I was oh, like, gosh, what? Was and Kidman and her, oh. So I actually ended up, I had seen that movie at this place called Tampa Pitcher Show. I don't even know if it still is there, but oh. it was like you could get food and beer. So I was like a little tipsy. Oh. So it, I, I was shook. Man, that is a... Uh... <laughs> actually it was that was a really cool place but i don't even know if it exists anymore but anyway yeah great story i really loved it and i can't wait to hear like after you get to experience it like if you if you get actually experience i hope i experience everything i just researched okay because that's exactly what i need well you know now that you're like you've done the research and you're open to it maybe maybe they'll let you in and I, I, I think that I maybe have a little intuition anyway so come on in ghost come say hi Renee, what do you have for me this week? So today I'm going to be talking about the Port Arthur Massacre. We're going down under. You again. love an Australian story. I really like it there. That's fine. I'm down. Um, under. Yes. <laughs> oh. Like that? But I'm... Oh, shit. I love it. Um, yeah. So I'm just going to go like kind of like right in um, because there's like a lot to cover. You know, yeah, you'll see. Okay. I'm ready. So the Port Arthur Massacre was a mass shooting that occurred on April 28th, 1996 in the state of Tasmania. Where the fuck is Tasmania? Well, you know, like the Tasmanian devil. I was just thinking that, but like where? Well, there actually is a... Oh, was that a country? Yes, in Australia. It's like a state in Australia. Oh, I didn't know if that was like a city, how they sanctioned that off over there. It's like they have um, state. I think they call them states. got it. Anyway. Understood. Yeah. I might be wrong on that because I don't live there. (laughs) The perpetrator, Martin Bryant, killed 35 people and wounded 23 others. It is the deadliest massacre in modern Australian history. A mass killing is defined as an incident in which four or more people die within a 24-hour period, not including the killer. So just so you know, that's the criteria. Okay, got it. The first victims were David and Nolene Martin. They were murdered at Seascape a bed and breakfast property that they owned. This occurred at some point within a 12 hour time frame prior to the Port Arthur attack. They are also the only victims that were personally known to Bryant. All right. Bryant took the keys to the seascape as well as the Martin's weapons. He then began to drive towards Port Arthur in his yellow Volvo 244. Around 1.10 PM, Bryant paid the entry fee for the Port Arthur historic site and parked near the Broad Arrow Cafe. He went into the cafe and purchased a meal, which he ate on the deck outside. The cafe was particularly busy that day as many people were waiting to catch the next ferry. So it was packed. Okay. With no warning at all, Bryant pointed his rifle at the table next to him and fatally shot Mo Ying Ning Ying. I don't, I'm so sorry. (laughs) (laughs) Last name is just NG. Yeah, I think it's Ang. We did, we looked at this up. I did look this up. Um, He, who went by William, I should have just went, I should have (laughs) just stayed there. Uh, And Su Lang Chung, who were visiting from Malaysia. He then fired a shot at Mick Sargent, which grazed his scalp and knocked him to the floor. Bryant then fatally shot Sargent's girlfriend, Kate Scott. Hitting her in the back of the head. Oh shit! Yeah, it's just it's not gonna it's not gonna get any better. All right. <clears throat> and I wanted to make sure, like, I'm that we talk about every victim. So, um, there's 
There's going to be a lot of this. I'm so sorry. Hey, hanging in. <laughs> As Bryant turned towards Joanne Winter and her 15-month-old son, her husband Jason Winter threw a serving tray at Bryant to try and distract him. Okay, yeah. This allowed Joanne's father to push her and his grandson to the floor and under a table to safety. A man named Anthony Nightingale, for whatever reasons, decided to stand up and yell, no, not here. And Brian pointed the gun at him. He was fatally shot through the neck and spine. What are you fucking doing, dude? Don't be a hero. Not like that. No, I mean. no. Brian fired one shot that killed Sh Kevin Sharp. He fired another at Walter Bennett, which passed through his body and struck Raymond Sharp, Kevin's brother, killing them both. Oh, fuck. Like with one bullet. Wow. All three men had their backs to Brian. So unfortunately they were unaware of what was happening. So there, I mean, if you're looking for some kind of silver lining, in I that guess. One. Yeah. Gerald Broom, Gay Fiddler and her husband, John Fiddler were all hit by bullet fragments, but survived. Okay, good. There's, there's mm -hmm. some light. Yes. He then shot and killed Tony and Sarah Kistan and Andrew Mills, Thelma Walker and Pamela Law were injured by fragments before they were dragged to the ground by their friend, Peter Crosswell. Also injured by these fragments was Patricia Bar Barker. That's a hard one. <laughs> <laughs> wow, I need to get it together. <laughs> Bryant then turned to the table occupied by Graham Collier, Carolyn Lawton, and her daughter, Sarah. And I believe Sarah was 15. I didn't, I think she was 15. Collier was shot in the jaw. Carolyn Lawton threw herself on top of her daughter to try and shield her. She was shot in the back, and despite her efforts, Sarah had also been fatally shot in the head. Mm -hmm. He then pivoted around and fatally shot Mervyn Howard and his wife, Mary Howard. As Bryant moved near the exit, he shot Robert Elliott in the arm and head, but he survived his injuries. Jesus. <laughs> So from the first shot, this all only took approximately 15 seconds. 17 shots were fired, 12 people were dead, and 10 more were wounded. Disgusting. In 15 seconds. Disgusting. Like, like imagine. It's, you know, when you're reading it, you don't realize, like, it makes it seem so much longer. Like, 15 seconds is just, it's a blink, you it's know? A, it's less than a blink, really. And it's, then, like, so much can happen in that. It's insane. Yeah. Bryant then moved towards the gift shop. Many people used this time to hide under tables and behind displays. He fatally shot the two women who worked at the gift shop, Nicole Burgess and Elizabeth Howard. He then shot and killed Dennis Lieber. Gwen Neander was running towards the door when she was shot in the head and killed. Like he is, he's just relentless. Bryant saw movement back in the cafe and shot at a table, hitting and injuring Peter Crosswell. Now, Jason Winter, who was the guy from before who had thrown the tray, uh -huh. he mistakenly thought that Bryant had left the building, so he moved out into the open. Oh, no. He was shot in the hand, neck, and chest before being fatally shot in the head. How many fucking rounds are in this goddamn gun? Shit. He had... Well, no, he only had one at this time, but it's a semi-automatic rifle. I so. know anything about guns, but... Yeah. <sighs> Um, and he had extra ammo too. So like at some points he like reloads and things like of that. Of course he did. Now Bryant turned back to the gift shop. Oh, wait, hold on. I didn't, I messed up here. Dennis Olson, an American tourist, suffered fragment injuries to his hand, scalp, eye, and chest, but survived. All right. Now Bryant turned back to the gift shop where he fatally shot Ronald Jerry, Peter Nash, and Pauline Masters. Peter Nash had thrown himself on top of his wife, Carolyn, who was thankfully not seen by Bryant. Ugh. He reloaded his rifle and left the building. In the cafe and gift shop combined, he fired 29 shots, killed 20 people, and wounded 12 more. Holy fuck. And unfortunately, we are not done yet. Oh, so. no. Bryant then moved towards the coach parking lot. He shot one of the coach drivers named Royce Thompson in the back. He was able to crawl underneath one of the buses, but later died from his injuries. And I did realize, just so you know, and it's sometimes the words are different. And I think a coach and a bus is the same thing. Like, that's what I gathered from my kind of my research. Okay. So um, if I, you know, like, if that makes sense. Yeah. Because it, it took me a little while. Got but. It. <laughs> he shot at people trying to hide. 
and hit Bridget Cook in the thigh. He then went around to another coach and fired at another group of people. Winifred Applin was fatally shot in the side trying to seek cover. Yvonne Lockley was grazed in the cheek by another bullet, but she survived. Bryant then shot Janet Quinn in the back where she fell, unable to move near Royce Thompson. On the way back to his vehicle, he shot Dennis Hutchinson in the arm as he was trying to run away. At his vehicle, he exchanged his weapon for a self-loading rifle. <sighs> now this is terrible. Okay. He comes back, he comes back, moved back to the buses where Janet Quinn lay injured and fatally shoots her in the back. Like, mm. like why, like why? You know, he went on to one of the coaches and fatally shot Elva Gaylard in the arm and chest. He shot at an adjacent coach hitting Gordon Francis. Francis did survive, but ended up needing four major operations. Oh, fuck. Neville Quinn, who was the husband of Janet Quinn, had escaped, but returned to look for his wife. When Bryant spotted him, he chased him around the coaches fired at him twice, and Quinn jumped on to a coach. Now, unfortunately, Bryant followed him, pointed the gun at his face, and said, no one gets away from me. Quinn ducked, and the bullet missed his head, but it did hit him in the neck, momentarily paralyzing oh, him. Oh, Jesus. Lord. Um, This next one is arguably the um, most disturbing one, so... Bryant went back to his car and drove towards the exit from the historical site. Running ahead of him were Nanette McHack and her children, Madeline, three, and Alana, six. He got out of his car and forced Nanette to get on her knees. She did, and he fatally shot her in the temple. He then fatally shot Madeline and Alana. Can I insert a rant real quick? There's no reason. They were like, he was already in the car, and they were just running away. There was no reason. Like, why the fuck do these things happen like let's get down to the nitty-gritty here it's got to start with mental health i mean 100 percent. oh yeah no matter what is going on in the world mental health is the forefront of how we operate and everywhere yeah and if that is not correct shit like this is happening and guns should not be allowed really i mean and that's my opinion i there's no need they certainly shouldn't be um as easily accessible like i I see maybe hunting reasons okay I, i'll give you that i see maybe you want to say protection all right i'll give you that but if it wasn't at all available we would have to then resort to things like knives you know like mm -hmm. yes people could still kill but i think that we have a lesser chance of mass suicides with some knife action going on oh for sure you know what i mean for sure that's my <clears throat> little rant and, well, I'm, really, and I'm just fucking <laughs> i'm just really fucking sick of everybody dying yeah for no reason and children come on it's that's the worst now um i didn't i'm not talking a lot about the the killer in this story because i wanted to kind of focus more on the victims Absolutely. however um he did suffer from he did suffer from mental health issues um really since childhood so he was failed by a lot i mean by a lot of people by not having these things addressed um but then you know he was i think he was born in the late 60s okay so it, it's just you know like i don't know they just didn't take it seriously and not that they really don't even now they really they certainly didn't absolutely not. you know back then yeah. so yeah so back to this <laughs> he drove up to the toll booth and blocked a 1980 bmw 7 series inside the vehicle were mary nixon driver Russell Pollard, and Helene and Robert Salzman. After an argument with Salzman ensued, Bryant fatally shot him. Pollard got out of the BMW and was fatally shot in the chest. He then fatally shot Mary Nixon and Helene Salzman and removed them from the vehicle. He transferred his ammo, handcuffs, and AR-15 rifle and a fuel can into the BMW. And then he, you know, essentially carjacked it. Mm-hmm. Bryant drove up to the service station and cut off a Toyota Corolla being driven by Glenn Piers. His girlfriend, Zoe Hall, was in the passenger seat. He exited the car and attempted to pull Hall out. Piers got out and Bryant pointed the gun at him and forced him backwards into the trunk of the BMW and locked him inside.
Bryant then moved back to the Corolla, and as Hall attempted to climb into the driver's seat, he shot her three times, killing her. Gee, well, I just don't get it. I just don't understand. He was just on just a an absolute rampage. Who knows what, if anything, was going on in what his head? What gets somebody like, to the point to where, one, they consciously can allow themselves to do it, and then feel you can't feel anything when you're going through that. No, How could you? It's got to be a blur, right? Like, that's just fucking awful. Yeah. So he starts driving back down to the seascape, which was the, the original bed and breakfast. Um, while he was driving, he shot at a passing Ford Falcon, shattering its windshield. Just, you know, why not? Why not? <laughs> when he arrived at the seascape, he fired into a passing Holden Frontera four-wheel drive, hitting the driver, Linda White, in the arm. Another vehicle was driving down the road, and Bryant shot at that car. Smashing the windshield, injuring Douglas Horner by pieces of it. Now, is all of this that you're mentioning, is that part of the 29 people he killed? Or is this in addition to what you're saying? No, I mean, well, he didn't, these people, thankfully, like, didn't die. But I, they're included in the injuries. In the, okay, got in it. the injuries, yes. Understood. Thank you. Um, so, yeah. So, Douglas picked up Linda White when he saw that she had been shot. And they went to the Fox and Hounds Inn where they called the police. Okay. So that was like down a little ways. Yet another vehicle drove past and Bryant shot at that one also, hitting the passenger Susan Williams in the hand. Simon Williams, who was driving the car, was struck by fragments. <sighs> Bryant removed Glenn Pierce from the trunk and handcuffed him to a stair rail in the Seascape guest house. And at some point, he set the BMW on fire. Again, why not? Yeah. The following morning, on April 29th, Bryant was captured when a fire broke out in the guest house. At this time, it was discovered that Piers had been shot and had died before the fire had started. The remains of the Martins were also discovered at this time. <clears throat> on November 22nd, 1996, Martin Bryant was sentenced to 35 life sentences for each murder and sentenced to another 25 years for his other charges. And we'll go over those. So uh, 20 attempted murders, three counts infliction of grievous bodily harm, the infliction of wounds upon a further eight people, four counts of aggravated assault, and one count of unlawfully setting fire to property. Property. So they didn't, so does Australia, and maybe you don't know this, I, do they not have a death penalty? I'm, I don't think they do. Okay. And that's because I think this would warrant, this would be a death penalty case in, in the U.S. for sure. Um, I don't think they, I'm assuming they don't have it. And honestly, I mean, really most countries, I, I don't, I, I, okay, I'm, there's a lot of countries in this world. So this might not be true, but like, I feel like a lot of the, most of the main countries do not have the death penalty. Yeah. Like a lot of them just don't do that. I mean, so. I could ask Siri, but maybe she'll give me the wrong answer. We don't want that on the air. No, so. no, we'll, we'll ask her later. Right. <laughs> <laughs> now, following this spree, Australia implemented strict gun control laws and formulated the National Firearms Agreement, restricting the private ownership of semi-automatic shotguns, semi-automatic rifles, and pump action shotguns as well as introducing uniform firearms licensing. So you're still, you know, you can have a gun. It's just there's certain guns that are not allowed. Um, and then it's basically just having uniform regulations to be able to own a gun. That way, every gun is is known. I mean, it kind of tracks, yeah. you know. Um, the government initiated a mandatory buyback scheme with the owners being paid according to a table of valuations, depending on what they were turning in. Mm -hmm. Around 643,000 firearms were handed in and at a cost of $350 million being you paid know what? out. It's worth the lives. It is. Because since these laws took effect in 1996, this is 1996, All right. there have been no mass shootings since. Like not a single one? None. Not even a drop? I look, I, like I looked this up. Since 96? Since 96, Australia has had none. Now, I'm just going to go in comparison. Yeah. I'm just going to leave you a little tidbit uh, here. Right. In comparison, this year alone, and mind you, this, it's March 10th, okay? Um, there have been at least 10 mass killings in the United States where at least 47 people have died. And again, I'm going to reiterate, it's March 10th. I, I, 
And if you were to look up how many since 1996, I don't know if you could find that number. I actually did. And I, I didn't, I didn't write this down, but I did see the number like since 2006. It's, it's way too fucking many. It's way too fucking many. I wonder, and I, we might want to look at this another time, but I wonder what the murder rate is like. Just not mass shootings alone. Because if that has dropped murder, does and you think sequentially that that would help also drop murder overall as a statistic. Yeah. I mean, all I know is I just feel like there's got to be some kind of regulation. And clearly it's working in Australia. Um, hint, hint. You US, know, hint, just saying. and again, no, it's, you know, no one's saying you can't have a gun. Like, that's not like, that's not the point of this. It's, it's, you know, it's regulating, you know, what kinds you can have. And, you know, I mean, I know it like it, you know, like it pinches a nerve in people, but I mean, shit, I would, I would give up anything to uh, make sure that my kid doesn't have to worry about being scared of being shot in school. I would give up anything to go to a movie theater and not worry about some guy dressed in a Batman crazy suit <clears throat> would shoot me up and kill yeah. me. You know, I, there's so many other scenarios I could talk about. I mean, do but... you know how like unsettling it is to get, I get like phone calls from the school telling me just to let me know that, you know, don't be alarmed. Your kid's in the middle of an active shooter drill, an active shooter drill, like not a tornado drill, not like, you know, like we had to do it's, it's, our children are literally being taught how to survive a mass shooting in their school. And I thank God that like, you know, I don't like, I didn't have to worry about this in school. Yeah. Um, because the anxiety, I just can't imagine the anxiety. I mean, I'm a very anxious person. So the anxiety that I would have had, the anxiety I would have had in school being worried about, about that is I, I hate it. And it's even worse to think that all the technology we have makes it so readily accessible and available to really plan this shit out, you know? And instead of just having that random, you know, I'm going to go in and blow some shit up. Now you have the ability to buy whatever you want, get it whenever you want it, mm-hmm. and go wherever you want because you have the technology to do it. Yeah. And, you know, looking at Vegas and the Ariana Grande and uh, What's the Space's concert, you know, it's another example of what the fuck. Yeah, it's, it's what just... What the fuck? Just what the fuck, everybody. Literally. Get it get it together. Literally. Just get it together. Quit being fucking dumb and crazy, man. So, yeah. So, that was the unfortunate... Un- whoa! whoa! What was... Whoa. <laughs> I made a new word. I'm whoa. like Scott Weinberger. <laughs> we love you, Scott Weinberger. But, I, I love you. Know. you. Um... <laughs> <laughs> that was the unfortunate story of the Port Arthur massacre. Um, and yeah, it fucks me up. I, you're, all your stories are fucking me up lately. I'm not going to stop. I'm sorry. No, I, I want you to keep going. <laughs> it really gets me yeah. you know, excited. Great one. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, friends, my show sources for today's story on the St. Augustine lighthouse is the visit St. Augustine's website. StAugustineLighthouse.org, CNTraveler.com, and the Wikipedia article for the lighthouse. And my sources for the Port Arthur Massacre story was Wikipedia's article on the Port Arthur Massacre, Sydney.edu, and an APNews.com article. And the rest of the sources will be listed in the show notes. Fantastic. Renee, what is that written on your phone? It's like someone just texted you something. Oh, oh, oh. What is that? Mystery never sleeps. Oh, neither do we. Bye, Bye bitch. bitch. But I wanted to try it out. <laughs>